Welcome everyone to our April webinar of Why PBIS Real Answers from a School Near You. Um, we know, there's Stephanie, um, we know that April is a super busy month for schools. You guys are in a really weird time in 2021 of getting back in the groove, but also um, feeling like you've been doing school forever. And so we know that this has been, um, been requested by many people to get the recording. And so we're so excited to share this with you. Um, as you know, we are the West Virginia Behavior Mental Health Technical Assistance Center, and we are a collaboration between West Virginia's Autism Training Center at Marshall University and the West Virginia Department of Education's Office of Special Education. We are the hub of three main projects in the state of West Virginia, which includes West Virginia Early Childhood PBIS, which is coordinated by Dr. Amy Carlson, the school-wide West Virginia PBIS project, which I am Alicia Zeman, uh, I'm the coordinator of this project, and um, Mental Health First Aid, which is coordinated by Diana Bailey Miller. Whoop, that's a repeat slide. So um, we are, hosting this as the school-wide PBIS team. You can find more information about us at wvpbis.org, or you can um, follow us on our Facebook page at West Virginia PBIS, where we will share all kinds of information with you about what we are um, doing and what we have planned. Um, this is a new postcard that we're going to be able to send to you and share with you. If you can see, you can have a QR code to go to um, complete your school's tiered fidelity inventory if you're implementing PBIS. PBIS in your building. And we're also looking for implementation stories. So if you have had success with PBIS in your building and you would like to share more about how it's changed your climate and culture or how it's affected uh, reducing your um, reducing your office discipline referrals or anything like that, we would love to hear that from you. So you can just hold your phone up to that QR code and it'll take you to that Qualtrics survey where you could share your implementation stories with us as well. Um, here's a map of the state of West Virginia. Um, we have six, actually seven now, uh, behavior support specialists um, in the state. We have four um, school-wide behavior support specialist in the four regions. So we have Aaron Day in the north, Terrell Jones in the south, um, Jen Fletcher in the mountain region, and then Tiffany Hendershot in the eastern panhandle. Tiffany is actually on military duty right now, so I'm covering her region um, for the time being. Um, but we work mainly in K-12 to classrooms. And then if you look, you will see blue triangles and red triangles. Those <laughs> represent our Thank early you. childhood behavior support specialists. Um, the blue triangles represent Sarah Smouse in the northern region, and then the red represent Jess George in the southern region for the early child BSSs. If you would like more information about how we support schools, you can contact me at holt64 at marshall.edu. Um, and if you would like a request for assistance, you can scan that QR code and it'll take you to our form that will allow you to request support from the TA Center. Really what we do is assist teachers, students, families, communities, districts um, with technical assistance when it comes to challenging behaviors and mental health issues through training, resources, and promotion of evidence-based strategies and interventions. Um, we are not only the hubs of those projects I just talked about, but we do trainings on childhood trauma and trauma-informed classrooms, challenging behaviors and classroom procedures, functions of behavior and data analysis, family engagement, self-care for educators. And really, if you have a need that fits into the realm of behavior and mental health, we will do our best to develop a training that fits your needs. So if you're interested or you have an idea or you'd like to know more, you can reach out to us at um, the TA requests and we will be in touch with you. So let's get started on today's uh, webinar. Uh, we will be close on time because we have a lot of good things that we want to share with you. Today's guests, I'm so excited. These are some of my favorite people that I've um, come to work with are our West Virginia Tier 1 Model Schools and our 2020 West Virginia Spotlight Schools. I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, what that means. Clay High um, and Leslie is on her way and Lost Creek Elementary are two of our West Virginia Tier 1 Model Schools. That was one of the very first projects we rolled out at the TA Center once we were established and what that process um, 
means is that they have a tiered fidelity inventory score of at least 80 and they went through a process of filling out applications to show us the work of PBIS that they do in their school and the outcomes that they were having. It includes filling out the applications and a narrative and then allowing us to come for a site visit um, where we look at PBIS um, in progress in their schools. And so they were designated in that uh, first year that we were really working within the schools and we've kept them on board and we've done so much amazing work with them and we're so glad to have them as partners and I'm excited for them to share their experiences with you. We were in the process of um, doing the model schools program or the model schools framework and going through all of that process when COVID shut everything down in the spring of 2020. Oh. So we had received all kinds of uh, applications and we were going through the process of beginning to decide who we were going to do site visits for, but then schools were not implementing or schools were not implementing PBIS in the way that um, that is designed. And we knew that we couldn't keep the integrity of the model schools without being able to go visit these schools. So what we did is we pivoted just like everybody else did. And we said, let's let's find schools that have really used PBIS to help them through these challenges of the pandemic. And through that process, we were able to identify Suncrest Elementary in Mon County, um, Nitro Elementary in Kanawha, Matewan, Pre-K to 8 in Mingo, and Wheeling Park High School in um, Ohio County. Um, and we're so excited to have them share with you. And we're so excited for us to be able to do that, to begin the model schools process as well, because we have high hopes for these schools. And we're so thankful that they're all have taken their time right after school to come join us and share with other experiences with us. Let me tell you a little bit about how this is going to work. I'm going to bring up a question and um, three to four of each of these schools are going to give their answer to that question. Um, the first time that they talk, they're going to introduce their names and who they are um, in their school. They're going to tell us about their experiences. We're going to give each of the schools time to talk and then we're going to move on to the next question. And we have a, a series of six questions tonight um, so we can hear their experiences and um, learn from them as we go along. I need to tell you that the way this is going to work best, if everybody will go to the top and go to where your views are, if you choose speaker view, that will allow you to see who's talking and the screen at the same time. It will allow you to um, not be distracted by having a gallery view, view or um, and it'll allow you to be able to concentrate on each school's perspective. So up in the right hand corner, you will see the views um, and then you will be able to choose speaker view. If you have questions about that, we can help you. One of the behavior support specialists can help you in the chat box. Okay, all right. So our first question is, PBIS Essentials, how do you make it work? Um, from our point of view, we know that PBIS really becomes um, part of who you are and what your school does. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's easy. So I ask our schools questions like, um, how do you organize your teams? How do you teach expectations? How do you acknowledge appropriate behaviors? How do you have an effective discipline and data system? And how do you organize outside assistance? And so we're going to start with Lost Creek Elementary. If you guys will unmute and sh share with us your answer for how do you make PBIS work in your school? Hey, hi everyone. Um, my name is Laura Trent. I'm the principal at Lost Creek and I have Shakaya Baker. And I am the PBIS team lead. So we've been doing um, PBIS for a long time here at Lost Creek, um, but we didn't initially start out as PBIS. We started out as um, safe and supportive schools, and then we transitioned into PBIS. And so there were a lot of things that we had begun building before becoming a PBIS school, but then we had to learn how to channel that into. So a couple of the things that we did one of the big things was we organized our team and we really tried to get commitment. I mean, we wanted people who were willing to participate, but we also wanted um, a, a wide representative of the representation of the staff. So we wanted primary people and intermediate people and specialists because they all bring a different perspective to the team. So we did that. 
Um, we do monthly scheduled meetings. So what we typically do is at the beginning of the year, we just pick a date. Maybe it's the first Monday of the month or the last Thursday of the month. And we set that up and we share that with everybody. Obviously, there are times when we have to reschedule. Sometimes we schedule some informal meetings in between, but we definitely keep our monthly meeting consistent. And I remember early on when we were doing this, we my team was really committed and we met every single week. I mean, we just it was just because we were trying to build something. Um, teaching expectations. Well, first of all, we had to establish what our expectations were going to be. And so we engaged our students with that. So we um, posed questions like, what does it look like to be safe and responsible and respectful in like all of our common areas? And we had each class share information. And then as a team, we took all those and kind of summarized that and narrowed that down to what we currently have as our school-wide expectations. So we teach those every year at the beginning of the year. We spend a lot of time front-loading that, and then we typically revisit that um, coming back. Um, in terms of acknowledging appropriate behaviors, um, we do a lot of that through, we use Class Dojo. We started out using little um, coupons. coupons that we would give to kids in the common areas. So we've tried some different things with that, but Class Dojo has been our most recent. We've been really successful um, using that. And I'll let Mrs. Baker elaborate a little more. Well, uh, and when we teach our expectations, we have a weekly gathering, obviously not right now during COVID, but we do a Monday morning roundup, which is where we have a small school and our entire school stays in for about 10 minutes and we um, divvy up lessons for a teacher or anyone in the building, sometimes we bring outside people in if there's something to teach lessons on um, social emotional learning or whatever. The PBIS team sets that up. Um, we do that whole group. Our data and discipline system, we use Class Dojo. Class Dojo is actually um, where we do our positive and our negative points. Um, we use the data that we collect, collect on Class Dojo to report, reward positive behavior. And then we also take our infractions or our negative points and we use those for uh, referral sheets and conduct grades and um, stat meetings. And um, really, Class Dojo works uh, for us for all things PBIS right now. Like we've worked it to where it didn't start out that way. But after I think this is our third or fourth year with it, it's really working as for all things um, for our PBIS. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, any other highlights? Good. We can talk we can a lot. lot. I know you can. I'm going to I'm going to keep you right in though because we have a lot. So I appreciate that, and I think you did a great job um, highlighting the work that you do and how you organize that. I think Monday morning roundups are such. Um, such a good suggestion. I know much bigger schools may struggle with that concept, but being able to take that and scale that up or down for the size of your school is a great way to share information as well. All right, we'll come back to you for our next question. Thanks, ladies. All right, Suncrest Elementary. I think we all can talk a lot. We might have a problem, Alicia. <laughs> I know, <Yeah>. fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm Doug Gaither. I'm the principal at Suncrest. Uh, elementary school, and I have our uh, PBIS chair, Rachel Dodger, with me, and she's actually going to answer the question, but just wanted to give you a little background that um, Suncrest Elementary School used to be Suncrest Primary with 189 students, pre-K through five, and in the past three and a half years, we've grown to a staff of 70 and 515 students, uh, so we needed something to bring us together um, as, as a school. Uh, so basically, we have used PBIS as our school culture uh, builder. Uh, it really is the school culture. When you walk in, you're going to know exactly what we're about, uh, what our expectations are. Um, we do a morning meeting every morning that we've incorporated PBIS and our expectations, character traits, uh, second step lessons. All of that's been incorporated um, into one um, sort of component of our morning meeting. But um, it's been very successful here. You, like I said, when you walk in, you know exactly what we're about. And um, I'm going to turn it over to Mrs. Dodger when she'll give you more specifics. But uh, we're we're just so pleased with PBIS. It has really changed the culture of our school. Hello, I'm going to talk about the different things that we do. Are you okay? We're good. Um, 
So in the past year, a lot has been altered in our team meetings due to the ever-changing schedule with students out, teachers out alike. So what we have done to organize a team meeting schedule is plan for one each month like we had in the past, um, but sending out a memo a week ahead of time with the agenda for teammates to be prepared to answer since it's a little bit more of a limited time. Um, and our meetings are now held virtually to ensure our safe environment. So in our meetings, we frequently talk um, about the importance of teaching expectations as well as share how and when we do this in our classrooms. So staff bounce ideas back and forth in different ways to teach the matrix rather than just always reading it word for word from the matrix because you all know in elementary school that doesn't work. So we bring the students to the site in which the expectations need to be met so that they can practice the expectations of the matrix. So the way that we do acknowledge appropriate behaviors is by using a star card system. So it's just a little piece of paper that has um, the name, if you're being safe, tidy, achiever, respectful, because we are the stars. Um, and when we notice the students modeling appropriate behaviors, we pass one of those star cards out and circle the category that it's in and make sure to acknowledge why they are receiving what they're receiving. And we have... Um, a, not a limit, but we want to try to pass out at least five a day. And that's not just teachers, that's custodial staff, that's secretaries, administration, so that kids are acknowledged in different areas throughout the building. So our discipline and data system that we use has a flow chart that we adhere to as a staff. So what's an office referral versus what can be handled in the classroom? And if students are in fact referred to the office, then um, we have all of that data stored in a system. We have to fill out an office referral sheet. And then at our meetings, we go through to see is there a particular area of the matrix that's being violated over and over again so that we can see, because it's an ever-changing document, is there anything that needs altered and adjusted to fit the needs of the students? As far as outside assistance, um, it's been limited this year to only parent contact to be able to have one parent representative to enter our meetings so that they can give us some of their input because of COVID. Um, we haven't been able to invite as much outside assistance, but we plan to in the future. Awesome, thank you so much, Suncrest. Um, I appreciate the work you do and um, sharing that with us. Mate Juan, pre-K to eight. Do you like to share how you make it work in your building? Uh, yes, and my name is Carrie Sloan from Mate Juan, and I'm the English teacher for six, seven through eight. So we probably have a lot to say as far as the behavior thing, because we, we've implemented from pre-K through five and then differently for six through eight. So just like they were talking about the matrices, we've created two separate ones. So we have our clause and then we have our pause. So um, the pause is pretty much specifically for the entire school, but mainly generated towards the little kids. And we kind of up the ante a little bit with our clause because it talks about leadership and it's talking about character. And that's what we really want our older kids to kind of do and maybe represent and role model that for the younger ones. So a way that we can keep track of our pause and clause is just somebody mentioned Class Dojo. Um, our younger grades do that, and with the older grades, starting from about fourth grade to eighth, we give badges on our learning module system, which is something we're all familiar with now with COVID. So the kids know how to go on there and see if they've earned some badges, if they are being recognized, and we do that also through our student of the week. So we've ended up taking as much as we can from the COVID rules and trying to acknowledge and motivate our kids as much as we can so each homeroom teacher will send down a student of the week and they'll get to choose from our pause cart which has lots of t-shirts and little little things so just let them know that they're recognized for meeting up those standards yeah we can't actually have the other thing that we do which we've talked about before alicia um where we let kids sign their names if they want to play volleyball with myself or Miss Irwin or play kickball with the math teacher. So it's kind of trying to integrate COVID rules until we can get back to regular scheduled programming. Absolutely. And we've heard that. And I hope that's um, what the listeners take from this is um, one of the things we really admired about so many of the spotlight schools is how they how you guys were able to pivot. And we know we want nothing more than to get back to all the things we worked so hard to build. But we really um, appreciated that. Um, and so we're highlighting uh, what we have now, but I am certain in the future we will be highlighting all the other great things that you do as well. Um, 
thank you guys. You guys are doing a great job. I know you guys are really good about talking about PBIS. Um, oh, yeah, we have, we have a lot to say. I, haven't yeah, I know. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to tell you right now that I'm already planning on how we can highlight all that after this. This is just a, a great taste test uh, overview of the great work that you do. And we're going to work on highlighting each of your individual school's work um, over the summer. So the next question that we have because of time is staff buy-in. Um, and so what we know is that staff buy-in is really is essential to having a really um, productive and um, a, a framework that works um, in your school. But staff buy-in, we won't lie, is, is really hard at times to get everybody on the same page. And sometimes you have to have some mindset shifts. Um, and so what we wanted it to know are, are what are your secrets? And Leslie, I saw you. Um, I saw you and I think you're here. Um, just we want to know um, Clay High. I think we um, have our two high schools. And one of the things I love is that that we have a, a great represent, representation of high schools right now. We have Clay, which is in a much more rural area, and we have William Park High, which is one of the biggest high schools um, in the state. So I'm excited to hear your two different points of view of um, the staff that you work with. So um, Leslie, can you tell us what you think about staff buy-in and what your secrets are to that? Sure. Um, it, can you see me? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Awesome. Um, I think one of the biggest things uh, for staff buying when we were initially trying to get some of our programs rolling was the people who were driving PBIS just kept on driving it. And um, it's easy to get discouraged about different things that happen. It's easy to get discouraged, you know, if your administrators have to tell you no about something um, for lots of reasons, it's easy to get discouraged, but just keep on driving it and, uh, and showing that passion for PBIS and showing that passion for your school. Because when you get up in front of the teachers and you're, you're trying to say to them, all right, guys, you know, we're going to, we're going to be jumping through lots of hoops today. And, uh, we got to carry a 50 pound, 50 pound backpack and uh, we got to do it in two minutes. They're all looking at you first like you're crazy. But then once you start giving them the tools to make that happen and you own it and you just keep on, keep on, keep on, um, they are on board and that, you know, they're going to jump through those hoops in 30 seconds happily with two backpacks on, you know. So I think driving the people who are driving PBIS, it's so important that they have a really positive attitude when they're talking to staff and and that you don't get up in front of the staff and be like, well, you know, a principal said, we're going to have to fill out this worksheet today. You know, there's a different attitude rather than, hey, folks, this is really important. Uh, we got to make this happen. It's going to make things better for our students. It's going to make things better for you, you know, having that attitude. So I think that driving attitude is really, really important. And then um, the second thing is simply taking care of staff, um, taking care of them, meeting their needs, when they have questions, finding out answers to those questions, um, showing that you appreciate them. We've done many staff uh, staff appreciation dinners at our school that have gone over really well. Some of them are catered by students and some of them are catered by, uh, well, me and the school psychologist. Um, it just, uh, but there've been really creative dinners. We had a, like a winter wonderland themed dinner where students wrote really heartfelt thank you notes to teachers. Um, we've brought in speakers. We've had our CTE kids make uh, dinners. Um, and it, they're just really creative. There's a lot of parts and piece, moving pieces that are personal touches to the dinners that I think uh, the staff has really seen as positive. Um, but I would say the two pieces are one is your driver's keep on driving in a positive way. And the second one is, is taking care of staff. Um, those would be the two pieces. And I guess there's lots of components to each one of those, but. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Leslie, I think those are great, great examples of how you get staff buy-in. And Leslie is the, uh, the counselor at Clay High. And really when you're talking about drivers of PBIS, she's, she, you're looking at her face <laughs> right there. And <laughs> um, we appreciate the work that she does. Thank you, Leslie. All right. Suncrest. Staff buy-in. That was one thing we were really lucky with. We feel like, um, you know, we, Mr. Gaither and I were just talking. We needed something 
to bring us together as a staff. And whenever you have that common language coming throughout the school, it makes such a big difference with staff and students alike when they're hearing the same thing over and over year after year. Um, so the, what we do is in the beginning of the year, we teach our staff about positive behavior intervention and supports. So this year we had a meeting actually before school started to alter the matrix to create a distance learning column to talk about how students can be safe, tidy, achievers, respectful, and that while they're on their computer learning from home. Um, our, we had a mixed approach this year as far as a hybrid model that half the kids were in school, half the kids weren't, or sometimes we were all distance or sometimes we were all here. So we really had to figure out how to alter that and alter our expectations so that the kids knew what was expected of them. But not only the kids, the teachers also knew so that it was universal throughout the entire school. Um, so we have a packet that's sent home at the beginning of the year to talk to parents and students and staff that contains all of the expectations that we wanted for each area of the school. So during our beginning of the year meeting, we go over the importance of acknowledging appropriate behaviors to encourage the behaviors in all the students. So in a normal school year, we would plan out monthly rewards for students to cash in their star cards to be able to enjoy their hard work. And it was really neat because teachers would join in. We would have... Um, you know, dances, we would have popsicle parties, hot chocolate parties, movies. Um, it's a little different this year, but we've altered it to make it work in that sense. But it was just a sense of community. And that was where the staff buy-in really came in. The, de the professional development approach that we took, um, that was offered to members on the team to join the PD that you guys had. Um, at the beginning of the year, we went to the, or the beginning of two years ago, we went to the academy and it was fantastic. So we had four different representatives from our school go to that. And then we came back and then in turn did um, professional development for the people here. And then we had Mr. Gaither, myself, and our school counselor come to the tier two um, professional development to talk about interventions needed to that had to help for students to further assist if they needed to pass the tier one. So the way that we would communicate to our staff, the framework is through our monthly meetings. We have one member from each grade level coming to our, new, or to our team meeting, and then they go back and report our findings as well as they get the meeting notes so that they know what's expected. Um, and then anything that the team needs for that particular grade level, they come to the meeting, they can express their concerns, they express the things that have been working for them um, and anything that they might notice while using PBIS. So if anything needs altered or if something should be brought to the spotlight, we're able to do that as well. So a lot of times you don't see the changes that you want right away. Whenever that happens, we just base our monthly meetings off of what we can do to obtain an achievement. So if a classroom is having a particularly hard time following the expectations of staying six feet apart, um, things like that. We talk about how do you enforce that rule? What do you do with PBIS to make sure that you're doing this positively rather than pointing out the negative? So just to keep all that staff on the same page, that's what we like. Um, but one of the really cool things that our principal had started, we have a stargazer, which is a year or a weekly um, send out to let the people know what's going on in our school, what's coming up, what are important dates. But staff are now acknowledged in that, just like we acknowledge students. So instead of them getting a paper star card, it'll say stars too, and it'll say a staff member's name, and it'll talk about what they did. So it's really neat to just have that commonality, not only to students, but for us to be acknowledged as well. Um, and it encourages all of our staff to be able to do that for students in the building and to encourage one another. So it makes it really nice. Awesome. I love that idea. Um, what we know and sometimes we often forget is that adults love acknowledgements just as much as our kids do. So acknowledging staff is a great way to get buy-in. All right, Will, Willing Park High, can you share with us um, your staff buy-in secrets? I'm Stephanie Bugai. I'm one of the assistant principals at Willing Park. I'm also the career technical director. Um, I have to say, I've been an assistant principal here. This is my ninth year. Um, and two years ago, when Mrs. Daylor came up here as an associate principal, she's the one who brought PBIS to us. I was very reluctant at first. I have to admit that because I'd been here for so long in a high school. And I'm like, how is this going to work in a high school? This is crazy. Well, it does. Um, and talk about a driver. She was the person who drive and drove and drove us to get us to understand it and understand that it was going to work. So last year, we implemented it with our park cards, positive, attentive, respectful, keep going. And um, our discipline referrals went down, I want to say by like 35% right off the bat. Like when kids were being rewarded for doing good things, they quit doing the bad things, which was great. Plus, we also um, gave our teachers a little more responsibility of starting the disciplinary action on their end. 
rather than just automatically sending them to the principal's office, which to me was a great thing because it you know cut back on our referrals. But we also um, reward our teachers in a lot of different ways. In the fall, when we were a hybrid model also, half in and half out, and then then we tried the all in thing and then eventually we were all out because we had too many positive cases. So um, within that time, you know, the teachers were getting very frustrated because we were doing they were having to um, keep their online model going. Plus, at that point, they were just online. But at one point, they were online and in class in class both, which is what we are kind of now, because we have a lot of kids that are virtual learners and we have a lot that are here. We have a um, student body of like 1500 kids. And right now about 400 of them are virtual and the other 1100 are here in school. So the teachers have to keep up both things, which is a struggle for them. Um, We do have a two hour delay on Wednesdays to help with that. But we started, the morale was getting low because of having so much work to do and the pressure of getting it all done. So we started, we did a lot of reward, rewarding to the teachers in the fall. we had a root beer float cart that said, um, "Help! For, thanks for helping keep the ship afloat. Um, we did donuts one day. We did um, a ta- walking taco wagon. We did a lot of things that people like food. So we rewarded the teachers with food a lot. Um, but they were really appreciative of that. Plus, we also did something that one of the teachers actually suggested it. We do positive po- postcards for our students. And one teacher said, why don't we do positive postcards for the adults? So we did. And then we had them hang them on their doors. So we gave everybody like five postcards to give to who they wanted to give them to. So it's really nice to walk around the school and see them hanging on the outside of people's doors where their colleagues have encouraged them and rewarded them for what they've done well. Next, um, we also report our data at faculty senate meetings, which gives them a, an idea of how it's working. Um, I'm telling you, I was, I was, I just, I laugh when I see how reluctant I was two years ago as supposed to be the person who's in, who's the team leader now. So, um, you know how things turn around, but that's a good thing. And it has been a great thing. I've learned a lot about myself and about other people through which, which I think is important. Um, we also, um, for t- not next week, but the week after next is um, teacher appreciation week. So we are doing something every day for the teachers during that week. And one of the things we're having students do is when they go to their developmental guidance, which is our homeroom next week, we have, um, we're going to have them do postcards, kind of like the heartfelt note cards that um, Leslie was talking about. We're having them do a postcard for their fav- for their teacher of something sentimental, or, you know, something heartfelt that they want to say to them. And we're going to have those delivered to the teachers the following week too. So it's, it's amazing how when you, when you get people on board by giving them Rewarding them for the same things you want to reward the kids for. It's it just, it's been really impressive to me. Teachers who I never, like I said, I've been here for a long time. Teachers who I wasn't sh- weren't sure was ever, would ever get on board have gotten on board because of they see the change in the kids and the change in the school environment and the culture that we have here. My goodness. Thank you so much. I can't tell you. It makes my day that Stephanie admits that she wasn't sold, but now look, she's here. <laughs> she's here sharing about why it works at Willing Park. I'm going to kind of recap what I took from um, our schools that shared with us. Um, what And I love that it matches what with what the research tells us about PBIS. We know that if we can prove it to our staff through data um, and communication, that they are more likely to buy in. And I think we've heard that from each of the three schools, Um, how important communication, common language and letting your staff have a voice um, will allow you to have better buy in. And that you have to have dedicated time and and drivers, Um, your PBIS team and your PBIS team leader and your admin, they need to be the drivers for this program. And and so that everybody knows that this is important and that we're putting it all in to get the outcomes that we need. Um, You know, I've heard from each of them how they've, uh, uh, Clay, Suncrest, and Willie Park have dedicated PBIS time. I know it's true for the other three schools. Lost Creek often does a retreat at the beginning of the year where they are just concentrating on PBIS and what they need to do to build their system and have it in place. Um, And so I think that's really what to take away. To get the buy-in, you have to put the time in and you have to allow them to have um, them being the staff to have a voice um, and then prove it to them when it's working by sharing your data. Thank you guys. This is fast becoming my favorite webinar we've done all year. 
<laughs> All right. So data is always uh, an important conversation, and we're always trying to bring it to the forefront when we're talking about PBIS, because at its foundation, PBIS is a data-driven system. Um, and what we want is you to be able to take your data and allow it to guide um, the responses that you need to have for your students, your families, and your staff. So what we ask our schools were, um, how do you make the data system work? It's often a challenge, but we know it's integral. So Lost Creek, share with us your data stories. Okay. So we had, um, just like everything else that we've done in terms of PBIS, it's been a process. And we find something and we put it into practice and then we come back and we go, okay, this part of this is not working. And so of course you know that we built everything that we do over time and we're still tweaking. You know, you just, that's like a process that goes on and definitely data was a process um, in terms of looking at that. So initially, you know, we established a, a hierarchy. We had our positive expectations, but we also had like our behavior hierarchy. And within that, you know, there were steps of acknowledging behaviors that we wanted to see, but sometimes you're going to see behaviors that you don't want to see. And how would we handle that? And, and we had infraction sheets, which were paper pencil sheets that we initially started out with. And we had a paper referral sheet, which we actually still use the paper referral sheet. But on the paper referral sheet, you know, that's not being filled out until some other steps have happened. But once you get to that actual referral sheet, you're identifying the time of day that something happened. You're identifying the location. You're identifying what level it is. And, and initially, we had it um, to go with our um, PBIS program from before, but we switched it over to go with our current discipline policy, the state discipline policy. So we have you know, our level one, our level two, our level three. And so from that, we can identify, like, is there a particular time of day that is that more behaviors are occurring or is there a location um, that is an issue? So we use that, but we also use Class Dojo. And Class Dojo, as you've heard us mention before, was something that initially we didn't use for everything. We only used it for positive. But we've now been able to acclimate to using that so that we can use that to keep track of all of our positive things. So we have positive class um, things happening and classes setting goals and class rewards, but we also have individual things. But then we can also use that to track some of our negative behaviors as well and have a way to address those sorts of things. Uh, we took our infraction sheet, our paper, pencil, and um, we worked really hard on the um, infractions or behaviors we don't want to see. So we put that into Class Dojo, um, and believe it or not, it really works. Um, we, you can view that data at any time. Um, anybody can pull it up. Actually, we have data people on our PBIS team. So, but we, we look at it once a month at our meetings, for sure, um, unless there's a reason Mrs. Trent or I feel that we need to look to see. But we use that data um, for conduct grades that teachers do. We use it for behavior interventions, um, for tier two planning, for um, our PBIS planning, where do we need to go from here? What, what, what are we seeing in patterns or discipline mm -hmm. or what's not working? Which uh, every, every month we find things that we need to change, obviously. Um, we have a reward and reteach um, program that we do uh, non-COVID when it's not COVID time. And we use the PBIS data or the Class Dojo data for that as well, um, individual student data, and we take it for our SAT meetings. And um, but it helps us identify our tier two and tier three students um, when we need to. So we've just taken what we did before in the paper pencil and put it in the Class Dojo, and um, it, it seems to be working. And we do that at the beginning of the year. I think we have the teachers enter it. Yeah, you know, the mm -hmm. the we, we use our own positives because, you know, your positive needs to outweigh your negative, obviously. But, um, yes, yeah, so I think that's good. Yeah, 
I think you did a good job. Um, that's years and years of work <laughs> that they just explained in like three minutes. <laughs> so if you're watching this and you're interested in how they were able to take uh, what was built from paper and pencil and, and switch it over, you can definitely reach out to Lost Creek, but also Aaron Day was integral in making that happen as well. So we can support you in that if we have piqued your interest with that kind of um, a background knowledge of what they're doing for data at Lost Creek. So thank you, ladies. Nitro Elementary. Hi. Hello. I am Ashley Garrett, the principal, and this is... I'm Misty Seed. I'm the PBS team leader. Um, so we, as a school, are very... Hold on. I was just making sure they could see it. Oh, okay. We are. Yeah, <laughs> we are very data driven. Um, oftentimes I say without data, all we have is an opinion. So the teachers are very used to hearing that. Um, so we've been, I've been, this is my fourth year here, but even whenever I came here, we, they had a PBIS program going on. When I came here, we started using the, we call our PBIS program is ROARS. So we have weekly ROAR sheets. They we're on a point, a daily point system, so they can earn up to 10 points a day. Um, and then they turn in these sheets to me weekly. The first couple of years, we didn't really do anything with that data until um, recently. Last year, we really started honing in on our data. Um, we tried to reward our students at first with um, you know, if they earned a certain percentage each week or every other week, they would get to go to a club of their choice. But what we were finding out is those students, those students in the reteach club, it wasn't changing. The numbers weren't changing. So our kids weren't moving from, you know, that tier two to tier one. Um, so we knew we had to really look at our data and figure out what was going on. Um, and so when we started identifying our at-risk kids to determine what types of interventions and supports, there was a big aha moment, I think, with the staff because the students that they were referring and considering at-risk did not match the data that they were turning in. So it kind of put ownership back in their lap, you know, or the responsibility back in their lap. Are they following the PBIS program the way it's intended? Are you, um, you know, making sure that they are either not earning or earning their rewards and following that. Um, I've lost track of <laughs> here. <laughs> so anyway, um, that was our big aha moment. So it put the responsibility back on the teachers in regards to making sure that they are following the program, making sure that they are following the supports that are in place for student referrals, whether that be through think sheets and the different levels of violations and following their, we have a discipline flow chart. So, um, you know, before it even comes to me for those level three and four offenses, all of those other things need to be in place. Um, and this Go ahead. Uh, in looking at our data, too, we were able to really analyze and hone in on where the frequent occurrences uh, were happening. And if there were specific areas like the lunchroom or playground and different things like that, we were able to come together as a committee and uh, figure out what it was that we needed to change and what we could do to uh, to make those things a little better, uh, whether it was being more situationally aware uh, in the lunchroom or, or that sort of thing, and just make those changes and, and then make them um, school-wide uh, so that uh, those those occurrences would go down. And they did. They did. Yes. I love everything you just said. And mark my word, Ashley Garrett, at the academy I'm going to have, without data, all we have is an opinion. <laughs> because I think that is probably the best explanation about why that should be the driving force of your PBIS program and of your school in general. Because um, what we need to do is to use that data to guide us to make the decisions that we need to make to make change. So. Um, inspired. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> awesome. All right, Suncrest. 
All right, I know I touched a little bit on this, but we do collect our data through office referrals um, through the referral slips that we have. We keep them contained in one area so that they can be disaggregated in accordance to what expectation was violated. Um, so when we look at them, we categorize what did that violate? Did it violate them being safe, tidy, achieve, or respectful? Um, but teachers individually track who is noted for appropriate behaviors through tracking their star cards. So some teachers will track these digitally and other will, or others will provide them areas. I think it really depends on the um, age of the students and how they want to keep track, you know, as far as divvying out who's responsible to be able to do that and who needs help with that. Um, so whatever is best for the grade level, it's individualized in accordance to how they're able to see um, who's keeping up with those appropriate behaviors. But when we look at our office referrals monthly in our meetings, we then look to see if there's a particular area that's being violated more often than not because we're going back to that, how you always talked about how the matrix needs to be kept live. It's a working document. It's not something that's just constant. Um, so we look to see, is there anything that needs altered? And if we have all of our office referrals for being safe, we discuss what needs to be done to enforce safety expectations or look to see if um, something needs changed and any expectation for it to be more clear for students because perhaps we were, you know, maybe a little foggy in student terms for it. So that's kind of how we look at our data. But I think Mr. Gaither was also going to speak a little bit on this as well. Sorry about that. Uh, I, I agree with Alicia that um, it, without data, you have an opinion. Opin opinions are important too, though. We, you, you do have a feel of what's happening. And I think when we first started PBIS three years ago, we did, we did go off of opinion a lot more. And as we progressed through the years, data is becoming more important and is a more is a more of a driving force for next school year we have the the privilege of piloting a program called um, panorama which is a digital um data board a data wall but it's digitally done for each student and we're going to be actually adding our data discipline data into that our pbis data into that sort of like you did when we if you anyone has used swiss with mm -hmm. pbis before we're going to be using uh, this the panorama as our data wall, and we're going to be adding the PBIS information into that. So we can actually look at each child and see um, what are there violations that ch that particular children are are um, having an issue with or expectations they're having a, an issue with, and be able to do that. So it's growing. Uh, we're excited about the panorama and PBIS. Uh, data will just flow really nicely into that. So we're, we're excited about that for next school year. I'm excited about that too. Um, what you don't know is that my team earlier, we were having a big conversation about um, how we support schools in just the manner that you're saying with Swiss or with PBIS apps, or I'm certain that they all are writing down Panorama to learn more about it as we speak, because um, we know it's, it's such an important driver. Um, for for your framework and for how we help kids when they're having challenging issues. I also appreciate what you said about opinions. I will tell you that we were recently at a PBIS meeting at Lost Creek and they were having a uh, conversation about students that they knew that they were struggling and we hadn't even got to the data portion of it. But when it was the data specialist time, she said, we don't need to talk about these kids because you already knew who they were. Um, and I think that is so powerful. It is, you're right. It both both are important, um, but I think it is important to have um, the data to back up what you know about students. Um, and so I think uh, it's important uh, as to wrap up the data section. Um, by the way, Leslie or Stephanie, I know you're not scheduled for this, but a high school opinion would be great if you have something to say about data. If you don't, I'm, I apologize for putting you on the spot. Um, you can unmute and I'll see you if you have something to share. Um, but I think the important thing is, is that each of these schools represented that they had a system that everybody knew. Um, everybody knows how to use the system and everybody knows that the, the, the PBI's framework is relying on the data that they're sharing so we can make change. I see you, Leslie. Um, we use uh, Weavis data, of course, uh, just uh, like everybody else for discipline data, but um, along kind of like marrying the uh, opinion versus uh, just d discipline data is the anecdotal data. And we do a lot of um, needs assessments and quick, you know, five question assessments, both with our staff and students. Um, and those kind of help us to gauge where we're at in the year, especially as far as our, uh, we do these monthly activity 
events. Um, and they let us know everything from what kind of food people want there to what kind of prizes to um, did you learn anything from this um, environment or from this experience, um, anything. But that anecdotal data that you're going to get can really help uh, add some flavor to uh, your initiatives that you're doing within the school. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. All right. Next, we have family engagement. Um, I think 2020 family engagement has, um, we've all, always known that family engagement has been important, but we've needed families more than ever as important stakeholders um, during this COVID times. So, and we also know that engagement on any level equals um, better outcomes. So engagement uh, in the classrooms with academic learning equals better outcomes. Engagement equals be better behavioral outcomes. And we know that we get better outcomes when we we um, have engaged families. So any insights into hurdles or successes that you've had with family engagement? And we'll start with Nitro. Well, um, you know, some of our, I think our biggest roadblocks in regards to um, the family engagement I think that was the question, yes. um, was just making sure really that there was just consistency throughout the entire building and making sure that we all have the same expectations. Um, so it doesn't look like, you know, one class is always excelling with students with 80% or better. And then you've got one classroom who you've got kids at 60 and 50 and 80 and 90. So um, at first that was an issue with us. Um, we, it, kids were just kind of all over the place, um, especially because classroom teachers do have different expectations. We all have our different personalities. So just reining that in, we, we were able to do that with a discipline flow chart um, that kind of gave some guidance and some clear expectations as to, you know, how we need to handle certain behaviors. Um, some things that we have in place that works is our rules matrix. Also, our um, every week we send home um, our, the students get their ROARS um, percentages sent home. So parents are very aware of what that percentage is when they see it um, and they know what their behaviors are. And so if they're seeing a lower percentage, then they know that there's some issues going on in the classroom. Um, um, we have our ROARS tickets that we hand out anytime we see, we acknowledge positive behavior. Um, and a wildcat wheel. So that's something that we um, we bring in the cafeteria each week. The kids get to spin it. Um, names are drawn from it and that's how they get to spin the wheel. So that's something that has motivated them actually more so than, you know, being able to go to clubs. And that has actually moved kids in and out of the tiers. Um, as simple as just giving prizes and acknowledging, uh, letting them spin a wheel. Um, we communicate, we have our website, we have daily communication um, through our war sheets and also the weekly. We, on Facebook, we um, have a brochure <laughs> too that we've made for our families. It just kind of goes through exactly what our wars program is um, and the different way we support it and what the expectations are. So the families are very aware of what those expectations are as well. Everybody knows what our ROARS program is, what it stands for, what it means. We say the pledge every morning. Um, and it's also in our student handbook that goes home um, each year as well. Awesome. Thank you so much. Mate Juan, would you like to share uh, your experiences with family engagement? Sure. Um, I'm Ms. Fields. I'm the assistant principal at Mate Juan. And um, our, I think our biggest roadblock block this year to family engagement has been motivation. It's been a very trying year to motivate our students, especially the ones that are virtual. The students are virtual, but they are our students, and we wanted to make sure that we didn't leave anyone out. Um, we feel like that through the uh, proper communication with our families, then they, they would get more on board. When we were communicating effectively, they were becoming more engaged. So uh, we started morning meetings on our LMS. We really utilize our LMS a lot because in Mingo County, we only had like nine in-day schools until after Christmas. So we literally, all of our students were, the majority of our students were virtual the whole first semester. 
which was really difficult. We had, and it was very hard to motivate our families. So we started utilizing our LMS, our Blackboard, to communicate frequently with the parents. Uh, we uh, we also, uh, we would have our counselor and our social worker on the LMS or constantly making phone calls and talking with the families. One thing that we really did, and this was just kind of decided upon the teachers. We didn't have a meeting. We just saw like an opportunity. On Fridays, uh, Mingo County delivered food or to the students. Maybe it was twice a week. Twice. Yeah, Wednesdays and Fridays. We So the teachers were like, hey, I'll get on the bus. I'll deliver food. I'll do this. So we took that as our way to engage with the families and talk to them and like give them little things like if it was Red Ribbon Week. We put stuff in the bags and the teachers, all of our all of our buses had teachers on them uh, going out into the community and talking directly with the families I'm like, hey, we miss you. It's going to be OK. We're going to be back soon. And just this is what's going on. Get on your LMS. Um, giving the students shout outs on the LMS has been really motivating to them and to the parents. I think sometimes they just get on there to see if their student got a shout out rather than maybe do their assignments sometimes. But um, the teachers have had little contests within their classrooms to motivate students to uh, increase student participation in the lessons. They've done like pie in the face and um, different little activities. Uh, costume parties or a costume day or I know one of the classes had a virtual Christmas party online just anything to try to get the families engaged and for them to see you know what was going on and also during that time you know we made sure we threw our academics in there so the parents could see the importance of uh, what we were doing on the LMS. Um, we uh, One thing we found was that our students we're really struggling out there, even though the teachers were doing um, synchronized lessons every day and they had their morning meetings where they were informing the parents of what to expect for that day. We still saw students struggling and parents struggling to support those students. So our county was very innovative in offering virtual um, tutoring to our students. And we did it online um, for the parents that didn't want to come into the building. Or if the parents wanted to come into the building after school hours, we have teachers that volunteered to take these positions and work with the students that were in, still in virtual situations that, you know, felt disengaged from the, in the school environment. So I think that's been real successful. Um, but um, let's see, there's, we've, we've done shout outs. We use Class Dojo. Um, we... Um, I think I think the biggest thing for engaging the parents has been our counselor, our social worker and our morning meetings where the teachers are saying exactly this is what we're going to do today. This is what's going to happen. This is exciting for this week. Uh -huh. Just trying to motivate them to get on board. Awesome. And uh, I'm so glad you brought up your social workers and your counselors. I remember when we uh, had our discussion, um, you were really able to to use those positions in, in the past year to really build relationships with families that um, maybe typically struggle to build relationships with schools. And so I think that's something that everyone who listens to this webinar needs to hear is that um, the success that you're having of using those positions to build relationships to uh, get better outcomes for our students. So write that down if you're taking notes. Um, that's something that we're really um, I think across the board, we're just starting our AWARE coordination, we're, our, our, our AWARE grants and in three counties in the state. And that's part of it is how you use those outside resources to get great outcomes. Um, Clay, hi. Leslie. Okay. Um, we did a lot of the food deliveries um, and things that you're talking about, uh, trying to get in touch with students. I mean, obviously this year is a nightmare. Um, something that we did do that was pretty successful as far as uh, letting parents know about expectations for school is we put out some videos. And I think I might be talking about videos at another spot. Am I? Uh, so no, you're fine. Is safe. Okay, so the video is something that we started tapping into about three years ago. And if you, if your school does not use video, I'm telling you, you need to invest the twenty five hundred dollars in a MacBook and start watching some YouTube videos how to uh, do Final Cut Pro because it will change your world. Um, 
We have been able to make videos that have helped drop discipline significantly, help create flavor. The staff loves them. Um, they're funny. Some of them, some of them will make people cry. Um, some of them just teach. Um, but it's really been super powerful. We've done professional development with them. Um, it's been beyond anything that I ever would have expected. Um, and you say, oh, I don't know how to video edit video. Well, we didn't either. So we, we taught ourselves how to do it. And it's been beyond, beyond anything that I ever would have imagined. Um, can I talk about something that we're going to do next year? Is that for family? Okay. Yeah. So hopefully we can just put this year behind us and, um, in our community, we're, we're one of the aware schools. So, um, we're so excited about that. And with that, it comes funding. Um, so we are looking to basically have a, um, we call it our pit, but it's a student cheering section for athletics. And we're looking to use that to drive family engagement. Um, all the way down to preschool. Uh, we've got some really creative ways how to do that. Um, but we want to send the pit everywhere, basically. And we're going to use it to teach manners. We're going to use it to teach sportsmanship. We're going to use it to teach etiquette uh, on the bus. We're going to use it to um, do family engagement. Uh, we're going to allow parents to ride pet buses. So we're going to pay for pet buses. We're going to pay teachers to ride pet buses. And we're going to do a lot of this education piece while we're on the way to a volleyball game or football game or basketball game. Um, so we're going to look at rebranding and marketing our whole community. Um, and I think it's going to uh, be really, really, really powerful. Exciting. That's exciting. Yeah. Um if you need innovative ideas, ideas, Clay County is a place to look because they're full of how can we do this differently and how can we get outcomes. Um, I appreciate your guys' points of view on family engagement. I'm going to tell you what I heard. I heard that it's all about building trust with your families and communicating effectively. If we communicate effectively, we're going to get better family engagement, which means better outcomes um, for our students. I do want to follow this up. Because I failed to earlier, I've mentioned a couple of times that our AWARE grant is starting and Leslie just brought it up. We have a brand new behavior support specialist. Um, she just started. This is her first full week. Christy Fubio has joined us and she's going to be working with the three AWARE uh, counties in Cabell, um, Cabell Clay and Harrison County. And we're so excited to have her. And I believe you will be potentially seeing her in our webinar next month as well. She's here. We'll all wave to her, but I just wanted you to know that we have a new member of our behavior support specialist team. Um, the next question we have, and we're doing great on time, guys, is about hindsight is 2020. Um, what we know is this has been an incredibly hard year, year in a couple months by the time um, the school year wraps up. So what I ask our schools were questions like, what is one thing you did this year that you didn't do before, but you'll think you'll keep? Um, and what's one thing that got put on the back burner that you can't wait to bring back? So Nitro. One of the things that we, um, we started really focusing on this year um, was and it had a lot to do with family engagement too, is our student of the quarter. We, we ask our teachers to send to us somebody, we would choose one of our pieces of our matrix or the roars each time, and we would ask them to send us that student. Uh, we made a big fuss about it. We had yard signs made, and we made sure we recognized our e-learners as well with this. And if they couldn't make it to us, we got our PE teacher, we threw the wildcat suit on her, we threw her in the back of her truck, and we drove her along with our resource officer, and we went to, to houses, and we knocked on doors, and we told them, you know, how proud we were of them, and so, um, you know, that recognition just was huge for those students and uh, and for those kids, and we were in the paper, <laughs> so we were excited about that, and um, Mascot Junction, I, I don't know if you guys have ever used that, uh, but this summer we had uh, we had ordered a lot of signage and now the students are seeing the matrix like everywhere they go. If they're at the bathroom, there's a, that piece of the matrix, though that piece of the expectations for the bathroom are right there. They're highlighted. So it's, you know, it's reading material uh, before they go into the restroom. It's before they go on the playground. And I can see us 
adding additional pieces to that. I mean, it, it's made our school just really pop and, um, you know, our families see it when they come in and our expectations are everywhere. And also like Suncrest Elementary, we had a, um, we had a, um, a remote learning piece added to our ROARS matrix so that when students were logging on remotely, whether it was for inclement weather or it was because, you know, we were had to be remote, uh, there were those expectations there and uh, they were reminded of that. They were, they received their ROARS points for that. And um, I, I would say we'll definitely be keeping that in place because I don't see us ever having official snow days again, ever. <laughs> so um, something that got put on the back burner. Um, we're actually starting to be able to bring that back because of the restrictions that are starting to be a little lifted. Um, our wildcat wheel, um, Mrs. Garrett mentioned that briefly. Students receive tickets for roaring, um, kind of like a cop being good type thing, just you know, being kind to each other, um, different things in the hallway, in the classroom, and those are put into a basket. And at the beginning of the year, I was I was packing all my prizes and I was packing my wheel and I was trying to get to every classroom uh, to take and do those drawings. And now that we're back in the cafeteria, uh, we can make a big us about it and a big celebration and kids get to cheer and they get to celebrate each other and they're really pumped when their names are called and they get to come up and they spin the wheel and uh, they have prizes that they can take and choose from and really we've had some really great donations for those prizes and they really want to win and I, I really feel like that that has driven them to do even better and um, I just you know we're happy to be back in the cafeteria and, and get that up and rolling we go I go live with our e-learner as well, so they can be a part of the wheel. Um, they can elect to come to school and, and get with me and spin the wheel, or sometimes they have me spin the wheel for them and I put the prize in the office for them or, or even mail it to them as well. So I can see us definitely uh, taking and, and capitalizing on that when we get back to total normal. Yeah, I love those. Awesome. Suncrest. So one thing that we did different this year was add a distance learning option. And I know I've talked about this, so I won't continue to elaborate, but we did add that distance learning option um, so that students knew how to be successful and how to follow the expectations through that. But one thing that we did notice is, you know, we signed our acceptable use policy at the beginning of the year. And, you know, you sign it, you agree to everything, you pass it back in. So what we have seen is that kids are now adhering to um, the matrix as far as what they should be doing to be safe on the computer. So it's that constant reminder of the acceptable use policy. So it's more of a proactive thing rather than an, if you violate this, this is a reactive thing. So that's been really nice. Um, so there's clear expectations of what to abide by while on their Chromebooks. So what I think is cool is, you know, every year brings something unique. So if we would have to add or, um, you know, add a different column other than not just what we have in the school, but distance learning is not going anywhere. Um, we're always going to have students on the computer. It might not look the same format as what it does now, but continue to keep that because now they know what's exactly expected of them anytime that they're on the computer. Because we tend to think of our school, you know, as physical places, but then what about something you use every day? to have that consistent reminder. So we'll definitely keep that. One thing that did get put on the back burner this year was whole school rewards, which we talked about. We had some really, really cool things. The kids would know this month, this is what you're working towards. So it was definitely an extrinsic motivation for them. So that was pretty neat. We missed that. They loved working toward it. It was great motivation. We're still doing individual class rewards um, so that we can still reward them appropriately and safely, but it's different. It's nice to be able to see different grade levels mingling. So we're excited to get back to that. And then we used to do a star student of the month. So um, Mr. Gaither has monthly characteristics for the students to work towards, which we talk about in our morning meetings um, for that whole month. So that at the end of that month, we would say, okay, who's the star student for whatever, um, for humility this week or for this this month. So we used to do that. They'd have a big ceremony. They'd be recognized. Families would be able to come to it. So we're excited to get back to that as well. That sounds amazing. <laughs> um, what I love um, about what you all are saying and mate one, I'll get to you in just a minute. I love, um, I love the fact that um, sometimes it's the little things, right? Like we can't wait to see classes mingle again. And we're so happy to get back to the cafeteria and 
part of me can't stand that that has been taken away from all of you in the past year, but I love how we appreciate that. And I think as teachers and as, as students, there's a lot to say about those moments when we get to have those little, those, those special moments back. Um, so mate one, tell us about hindsight is 2020 for you guys. Okay. I'm uh, Danielle Irwin, the counselor at mate one. Um, well, I know to begin with, we didn't know what this year was even going to look like. We didn't know if we would come back in the building or anything like that. And I had so many kids on my mind that um, were like they frequent flyers per se that needed that extra attention that I knew, hey, I don't know when I'm going to see them. Uh, I don't know if they're going to participate online. Um, I sent out some uh, cards to their addresses and and just kind of touch base just to let them know, hey, I'm still thinking about you. Um that I still worry about you, and I sent my email address in those cards. So if they needed me, they could send me an email. Uh, something else that um, we did this year that we hadn't before, but is obviously working over um, the virtual with the, all the parents and kind of how uh, Ms. Fields had touched on LMS and having our meetings and stuff. It's a great way for like the parents to feel comfortable because they're in their own home, and, and the kids sometimes their anxiety isn't as high. Um, I've noticed uh, they can be more relaxed. They can say, oh, look at this. This is my really cool, you know, so-and-so, whatever this is. Or my brother just ran through the hallway. And so it's a way for you to interact with um, the families in a way that you've never gotten a chance to before because maybe they don't have a vehicle. Maybe, you know, they don't have a way to come. And and that's, you know, the inf- unfortunate part. So we've had to try to find the silver linings um, to COVID. And I've really... I think personally that being able to use uh, the virtual uh, LMS has been a lot, you know, a lot better just to kind of get that one on one relationship going. Um, something that got put on the back burner is something that Ms. Sloan had actually uh, touched base on too. And it was when we would have as a, a reward for PBIS each month, um, the teachers, staff members, all of us, we would kind of make, um, for instance, we would be volleyball. So we put down, okay, Miss Sloan, Miss Irwin, we're going to do volleyball and kids across the board, little ones, big ones. It didn't matter. It was, we all could interact. They would sign up and there would be a limit. So we'll say 20 and those kids got to play volleyball with us. So those 20 kids got one-on-one time with us or they could go read a book with the, the librarian or they could do um, kickball or play, yeah, crafts. take time, crafts, board games, um, even just a walk. Just And, and sometimes right. they just want to watch a movie or just a TV show and talk about hey, I love this because this character is blah, 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 or even eat their snack with their teacher. Stuff that they may not have been getting at home, they were getting from us. And I know every staff member here misses that. So that is one thing we are chomping at the bit to get back to, hopefully soon, hopefully soon. But that, that's one thing that we, we've been pretty proud of in the past, and we would love to get that going back. Yeah, I love, and I love... It feels weird to say, but I love how you all miss that stuff because it's going to be so great when you get that back and have that experience with them again. Um, so I appreciate that. Lost Creek or uh, Clay, do you have anything to add to that? I think um, this is Lost Creek. I think probably, I mean, it's really similar to what everybody else is saying, but I think for us, probably like our Monday morning roundup, which we kind of coined Longhorns for Life this year, which is really that opportunity for everybody to come together kind of as a school. It's a big culture builder and it's kind of like the kickoff for your week. And that really changes the dynamic when you don't get to kind of, you know, it's like a mom. I always say this, like if all of my kids can't come home for a holiday, it's not the same holiday. You know, even though I love them all, but, you know, you just want to kind of bring all your little chicks together in your room and like gather everybody up. And so I definitely think we're all looking forward to the time when we can come back together and do that kind of stuff again. Yes, we're doing it live or not live, but posting it on um, Class Dojo. So I think it's great parents are able to see Uh it. Um, I've seen a lot like that parents are in the know, I guess, more. So we may continue that, but it is a lot different. Than, yeah. than everyone being together and even being rewarded doing the weekly spotlights. But we definitely talked about what Shahia said, like, okay, we get to come back together, but maybe we still videotape it so that parents can 
yeah. do that because then they can talk yeah. to their kids about it and support it and kind of know the kinds of things that we're talking about at school. So, yeah, I love that. Thanks, ladies. Leslie. I know. I don't know if she's going to pipe. In. I, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I mostly what everybody else is saying, just the events where we can bring people together. That connectedness piece is what I mean, really, I think what makes the change for each student. So okay. that's it. Thank you, Leslie. All right. So our last topic is about outcomes. And I think this is um, one of my my favorite things, but sometimes it's the it's the hardest to put words to you um, because sometimes you can't see the force from the trees when you're in the middle of developing a framework. So this is the purpose of the whole um this whole webinar, why PBIS, what outcomes are saying, what outcomes are you seeing and what differences have it made for your school? Uh, Lost Creek. Okay, so um, I just, before I even get started on that, I just want to say thanks to everybody. You know, as you sit here and like, we've been doing this a long time, but it really doesn't matter how long you've been doing something. You always listen to all these ideas and like Shakai and I are going, Oh, that's a good idea. Oh, what was it they said? So thank you guys. This has been good um, for us. Um, and then kind of back to the response. So just if you think about it, I mean, there are so many good things, I think, for us as a school that have come from being um, a PBIS in terms of just like, first of all, everybody kind of getting on the same page, which a lot of these things have been alluded to as people have been talking, you know, throughout this, this webinar. But um, having a hierarchy that was really important to us, having a common language that we were all using. And I mean, you know, our, all of our staff knows that our parents know it, you know, and I tell my kids, like, even as an adult, there are three things that if I can say, was that respectful? Was that safe? Was that responsible? Like that carries you throughout your whole life. If you can't answer yes to those things, then you need to think about your choices, right? So um, we definitely have that language. And I mean, our cooks do it, our custodians, it's like part of our whole school. Um, we have a lot of buy-in and commitment, but that definitely has been built over time. And it's been through a whole lot of things, like a lot of the things that everybody's been talking about here. It doesn't happen at once. And you really have to have the ability to get in there to get your hands dirty and to say, wait a minute, we thought this was a great idea. We thought we had everything figured out, but we didn't. And this is the part we didn't think about. And that's okay. We're going to go back and change it. Um, we have um, lots of positive feedback. Our kids love the shout outs, but we do shout outs, not just for students, but we do them for staff, but we have kids doing it too. Like I had a little girl in fourth grade complimenting my pre-K the other day. And I just love like, her ability to be aware that, you know, and acknowledge that, to take the time to do that. That just makes her a better person. Mm -hmm. And think about that in the workplace in the future. Those are the kind of people that we want um, to be with us. Um, the kids love Class Dojo. They get super excited over the points. Um, even in the younger grades, we have like whole class goals. We have individual goals for rewards in the classroom. And they really get into knowing like how many points they get. Um, who can get the highest number that day. And so seeing those positive shifts in behavior and accountability and just kind of on the overall uh, school climate and culture. Yep. Um, I've seen a huge uh, impact and outcome with our parents. Um, this year, obviously, because of COVID, we were more, most of our parents are connected to Class Dojo and a lot of things are virtual or at least Schoology. But our families are seeing the positive as well as the, uh, you know, the negative. And I think that's really important because um, it makes better communication between the teachers and the parents, Mrs. Trent and the parents. If there is an issue or a SAT meeting, the, the parents are aware of this. Um, our families seem to be really dialed in. Um, we're doing our weekly spotlights, like our shout outs and our weekly spotlights on um, Class Dojo as well, which are just, there's a class or a school page. And um, everyone, I think the kids are more positive. Coming from someone who, when Alicia came to our school and said, uh, you don't need to have your clip chart or things where everyone can see when they walk in. And I was like, how are they going to, uh, I think I had a little anxiety attack because I teach first grade. 
and uh, it's been amazing. They don't they don't see those points. You just tell them, and they're excited, and they're, they want the positive. And um, my students are talking about our our second step and our you know uh, Monday morning roundups, and our parents are like I've had parents message me and talk about something their child came home and told them related to our long home prepared video. So um, I, I think after years of work, PBIS has became. Um, it's became our community here and it's very positive and uh, it makes us feel, we are a small school, but it's like everyone's family. Awesome. Thanks guys. All right. Clay County High. Why PBIS? Um, I think why PBIS, because it's the framework that can really change your school, I guess, on a basic level. Um, you're going to spend the time and the effort and the energy on no matter what. And it's either going to be the time and effort and energy on something amazing and something powerful, or it's going to be the time and energy on literally just trying to keep yourself afloat of treading water and putting out fires and, you know, managing madness. Um, so why PBIS? Because it's going to elevate your school and like literally make your hopes and dreams come true. Um, it, anything that you've imagined could happen in your school, it can happen with PBIS. Do you want specific examples or? No, I think that... you just said it. You might have okay. given me goosebumps too. <laughs> Thank you, Leslie. Okay. <laughs> uh, Nitro Elementary. Um, absolutely. We a thousand percent recommend and encourage other schools build a framework um, have those expectations for every area of your school in place, uh, seeing the positive growth with our students, within our students, the reduction in the infractions uh, because we're building that positive climate and culture. Uh, we don't yell at our students. Uh, we keep each other uh, in check as far as staff. We keep uh, hold each other accountable and we talk to each other um, as professionals. And instead of writing each other out, we actually uh, are able to have those conversations, uh, meaningful conversations uh, that um, for things that we can do and we can change with students. We don't we don't get into power struggles. Um, you know, that was that was a problem before. Just uh, just, you know, understanding the student and, and, and wanting the student to you know respect us. And and now it's we understand and our, our staff is understanding that it's a mutual respect and uh, our our uh, parents they're they're grateful uh, because the expectations are school wide and they they don't have to have questions about why um, Big Brother in fourth grade um, you know was in trouble for this but little sister did this in another class it's 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 come together and it's uniform and it does take a lot of work but it is so worth it uh, when you start to see those those differences made yeah, yeah that was one thing I know. Um, you know, since I came here four years ago, I've had specialists that come in or substitutes that have come in the building and have just talked about what a calm atmosphere it is here and what a positive place it is and um, that they enjoy coming here. So I just think that that's a big win for us too, especially with as, as much as we need subs right now. <laughs> that is a huge compliment. Thank yeah. you, Nitro. Suncrest. Yes, here we are. Hi. All right, the outcomes we have seen is a positive school community. So every staff member, every student, every member in our building, we're all on the same page with expectations. And it really did build our relationships with one another and made a huge difference. Our team outcome has allowed us to have conversations that we would not have had if we, if it, we didn't have PBIS. You know, it talks about, we get to talk about being a part of the big decisions for parents, teachers, and staff regarding expectations of the school. Um, and, you know, that was something that was new for us because, like he said, we had gone from being a small school where it's just you were expected to do what you needed to do because it was a small school and it was easy to do. Well, as it grew, we needed to have those expectations, and it was really neat for us to be able to come together to work for that common goal of that. Um, 
So now we're able to work together to see for the good of the school as a collective group, how we can keep everybody um, going along with the same expectations. But for our staff, our students, our families, there's been such a positive outcome since we've been building our PBIS school. This is going on four years or three years, four years now. Um, so students are introduced and exposed to the same expectations all throughout their middle school. Um, but what's really neat is that in preschool, they hear it. So then by the time they get to fifth grade, which obviously it's only been our fourth year, so we'll be able to see just what an impact it has made um, using that common language. So um, it's allowing us to build relationships with students outside of our homeroom too. So, you know, when you're walking through the hall, you can hear teachers complimenting other kids, you know, saying, oh, I love how you're shining in the hall. And it just really does show that they are looking for those expectations and it holds kids accountable, but it also holds teachers accountable as well to make sure that they are pinpointing, hey, wonderful job it builds that community. So we would definitely encourage all schools to build a PBIS framework for so many reasons, not to just have those consistent, clear expectations, but it really does provide such an excellent level of bonding and bonds form with students and staff alike. Amazing, thank you. I love being the last one to speak uh, <laughs> because um, I actually was a PBIS coordinator for a, a very large school system before uh, moving back to West Virginia. I had 104 schools uh, that I was overseeing their PBIS programs, elementary, middle, and high school. So the school had a little bit of advantage with me coming in as their principal because I had some background in this. Uh, but the uniqueness for this is that this school um, four year, years ago was kind of struggling to find their identity, um, who they were going to be, what they were going to focus on, where they were going to hang their hat, sort of thing. And this framework, um, and I think we need to stress that it's a framework. It's not a program. It's, it's not a step-by-step, uh, -step, color by number sort of thing. It really is a framework um, that started out in being a discipline program, being proactive. And what it's done for us and what I've seen it do in many schools, but firsthand here and being part of the groundwork here, it really is about building culture. And that's really what PBIS has done for us is to build the culture that Mrs. Dodger was speaking about um, across all grade levels, across the community. Um, I, I would say every, at least once a week, I get an email or a phone call from a parent um, sort of praising either a teacher or the school for something that has to do with PBIS. They don't know what they're praising us for. But they're saying things like, we just love that you're teaching our kids to be safe. We love uh, my child's more respectful now. Um, so they do that uh, because it really is the part of the school culture. And um, so I think PBIS has expanded from being a positive behavioral intervention and support to really being a framework for building a positive culture within your building. And that's what it's done here. Um, I, I'm going to brag a little bit. You can walk in. You're going to walk into this building and you're going to know what we're all about. You're going to know what is expected of the children. You, it's actually on the front of the building also, uh, literally on the front of the building, um, what we're all about. And if you speak to anyone, and I'm, I'm going to say this with confidence, you can speak to one of our four-year-olds in pre-K. They're going to tell you exactly what our expectations are and what those mean. Uh, you could ask a first grader, what does it mean, this, this shine in the hallway? Uh, and they're going to be able to tell you that's our, that's really what we do for the hallway, how we want students to their expectations for the hallway. So it's pretty incredible the life that PBIS has taken on at Suncrest Elementary School. And we're just, we're just really, really excited about it. Um, we're going to continue to grow. Mrs. Dodrell, our, our team leader, has been amazing. She's actually um, expecting twins uh, at next beginning of next school year. So she may not be with us next school year. She might be taking a leave. And so I'm, I'm excited to see who's going to step up to be our leader. I, I really think it's important that the leadership comes from, from the staff and not necessarily from me all the time. Um, the the, the buy-in's better if it comes from a colleague and not from an administrator. So someone will step up and, and fill in for her for a year. but. She's done an amazing job with this, and the school has done an amazing job. So uh, I would recommend this for any school that, whether you are brand new or you've been around for 150 years, 
it will transform your school in, in a positive way. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I think you guys hit all the notes that I wanted you to hit um, with YPBIS. Um, real quick, I just want to make sure Mate Juan and um, Willing Park, I just want to make sure if you could give me, if you're good or if you have something that you want to share um, to finish this out. You good? I think yeah. we're good. We've okay. taken a lot and we've got a lot of notes here. So. <laughs> I love that. Um, I'm inspired to do some follow-ups where we can get together and pick each other's brains about what you guys are building. So for everybody watching, thank you for your time. Thank you for thank you for the time that you take to watch the recording when it comes your way, if that's how you're viewing this. Um, once again, I'm Alicia Zeman. I'm the PBIS coordinator for the West Virginia State Project. Um, and I so appreciate the six schools that are here and the work that they do. And um, I can tell you that these six schools, any email that I send, any request that I have, they'll say, um, we'll give it a try. And we're in. And I love that spirit. Um, if you are inspired, um, you'd like to know more about PBIS, you can email me at Holt64. If you'd like to learn um, more about any specific school or any specific um, framework that you heard about today, go ahead and email me and I can get you in touch um, to get you more information. I hope everybody has a wonderful day and a wonderful week and um, we will see you next month for our May webinar. Thank you.